Tibet was historically is independent country, is a sovereign nation. We have all kind of I think kind of the uh, proofs that can approve that Tibet was never being part of China. What is middle way approach? We don't have exact information, exact kind of awareness of middle way approach. So that they always have kind of the misconception and misperception of middle way approach. When it comes to middle way approaches, actually it has a lot of the dimension, it's a lot of the principle or the perspectives, right? Ranzen or in terms of the independence. That sort of the, I think, kind of the mindset has already exists in our mind. When we are small, said our grandfather, our, our, our forefather, always talk about it. We lost our independence under China, and China is our enemy. We have already that sort of the kind of I think thinking in our mind. What China has implemented, kind of the political structure in Tibet since 1915, and we are not happy, and we are not satisfied with these mm -hmm. things. In like DCV, Suja, or I, I think in any DCV school, there is a kind of atmosphere, there is kind of the uh, space where we can. I have a debate, and we, but I used to consider my YouTube channel as kind of the platform where I can share what I have something knowledge about politics and what, what my understanding of politics, I mean, particularly international politics. Unsilenced Voices of Young Tibetans is a podcast presented by the Foundation for Nonviolent Alternatives where young Tibetans share their personal stories, experiences, opinions, and journey in exile. Namaste and welcome to our FNBA podcast, Unsilenced Voices of Young Tibetans. In today's episode, we will discuss the Middle Way approach, which is the official policy of the Central Tibetan Administration, also known as the Tibetan government in exile, when it comes to resolving the Tibet-China conflict. On top of this, we will engage about Tibetans on the YouTube space, how they are utilizing their freedom of expression, and also on the Tibetan children village which is the largest Tibetan school body in exile. Our guest today has a strong knowledge on these subjects. He is the executive director of the Delhi chapter of the Global Tibetan People's Movement for the Middle Way Approach, and also is the host of the popular Tibetan YouTube channel, International Political Commentator. So without any further ado, I welcome our guest, Enzo Amshula. Thank you. Uh, so, Monchula, firstly, could you tell us about yourself and your organization, the Global Tibetan People Movement for Middle Way Approach? So, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say uh, thanks very much for having me here. It's my great honor and a pleasure to share some of my thoughts and my views on the uh, Middle Way Approach. And also, I'd like to say thanks for your invitation on behalf of our organization as the uh, Global Tibetan Movement for Middle Way Approach. So when it comes to the, our organization, it was first found in 2008 and uh, since then it has been expanding is the uh, regional branch or is regional membership and also is, is regional coordinator. Today we have almost I think 23 or 24 regional coordinator regional uh, memberships. So this is how our organization has been found, how it has been changing with the uh, time being and also the main purpose and main objective of uh, creating this sort of the, I think, uh, organization is to educate to those different people who don't have that much knowledge and who don't have that much awareness about middle way approaches. So that's why this is our main uh, purpose and main kind of the objective of creating this sort of organization. And also we are uh, happy to work with the uh, CDA at, at Central Tibet Administration on any program on the middle way approaches. So uh, uh, yeah, yeah, is that all about our organization and uh, for uh, for myself I was born in Tibet and uh, where I have grown up for some time also and also I went be uh, I went to in Chinese school where I have studied about the Tibetan language and the Chinese language little bit and also after that I came in India in 2008 and I've I have been joining this just uh, for my primary uh, schooling and after this I have joined in uh, I mean, I stay in TCV Suja till class 12. Then I have joined in Delhi University for my uh, bachelor study of the political science. And also, uh, currently, I'm doing my uh, MA on Delhi University. So that's all about myself. Definitely, Wansha. A very interesting journey. And, you know, you really point out the nit and gritty of what this organization is. So I think we'll discuss more on that in the coming question. But firstly, since you brought up the thing about how you came from Tibet, you studied in a apparently a Chinese school in Tibet and eventually came to TCV, TCV Suja. So I would like to ask, like, because even I was studying in TCV Suja and I think we met, we, our paths crossed each other. And what were your experiences growing up there? And could you share us any profound moment that you felt while you were in TCV Suja? 
Yeah, <coughs> the, uh, when I was in TCB Suja school, I think I have lots of experience, I have lots of beautiful moments. But I, I want to share one, um, one of the most uh, kind of the memorable moments that I have gained in TCB Suja is like that. The, I think that in TCB Suja or I, I think in any TCB school, there is a kind of atmosphere, there is kind of the uh, space where we can have a debate and we can participate in any sort of, I think, kind of the uh, program. Uh, where we can share our thoughts and where we can share our views and also I think that kind of program has provide kind of platform where we can practice how we can be a great speaker and how we can uh, be uh, I mean how we for example what I'm become today like I'm sharing something on YouTube so all this because of what I have learned from DCV so I think this is one of something that I have uh, learned from DCV something that I never forget memory from DCV particular from Suja Definitely, and if I'm not wrong, I think you must have participated in a lot of school debates, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. So, very interesting. I think uh, the things that we learn in school is something which we definitely carry forward when we continue our life journey. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, and on top of this, you also, on this current path, you mentioned how you do your YouTube channel, and which is very much popular. I have a Tibetan friend who is also from Tibet, and he very much watches not only him, but uh, I believe there are a lot of Tibetans who watch your YouTube channel, which is called the International Political Commentator. It has a lot of subscribers. So can you tell us, not only me, but all our audience, what your YouTube channel is, what you aim from it, and how is it going now? Yeah, when it comes to the, my, my YouTube channels, I think actually it's, a, it's like normal YouTube channel, right? Yeah. But, uh, but I used to consider my YouTube channel as kind of the platform where I can share what I have something knowledge about politics and what, what my understanding of politics, I mean particularly international politics. So that's why I used to consider as a platform to share my understanding of politics to, to all my audience who used to watch my uh, YouTube, right? And also uh, these days my YouTube is going quite well because uh, my viewers and my subscribers, they're giving uh, lots of support, lots of love on my YouTube. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm pretty much sure it's going quite well and I hope it will going well because I'm doing so much I think kind of the uh, like invest on my uh, YouTube from ed every side so I hope my audience also will continually support my YouTube channel so that's all oh, definitely I think not only the support from your audience but I think we Tibetans need more such contents or more such channels because what I notice is, yeah, that sort of channel is also needed where you portray what you're doing in life, but some sort of analytical channels where you sort of analyze, especially your thing, analyzing the political scenario of the world. And one thing that your channel pretty much goes in deep is the Russia Ukraine, Ukraine yeah, yes. war. So, what is your thought on that? Like, yeah, yeah. Actually, I think when first time I start my YouTube channel, all of my that that kind of platforms. Uh, my first thought and my first kind of the expectation is to to give my thoughts on politics, to uh, to give some sort of knowledge and information of international politics. But I think, uh, but finally, I think that my YouTube is more focused on the as you mentioned the Russian and Ukraine war because it has quite the some sort of the important kind of the uh, political I think kind of the movement that that, that happening into today. So. Uh, my thought on Russian Ukraine war, I think this is uh, something very much important, the, uh, the political change that we have to understand. That, I mean, how that Russian Ukraine war has been started and what are the main cause of the Russian Ukraine war and how it is going and how it will end. So this is very much, I think, something related to the, our issue and our case. For example, how Ukraine has Ukraine has getting kind of support from the international I think, organization or particular this great nation and, uh, and also more important how this great nation are playing their own political game in the Russian Ukraine war and also and at the end of the how Ukraine government will take their own decisions. Not only listening what the, the great power is advising and what great power is providing kind of support but and at the end of the decision will make in the capital of the Ukraine. So that's why this is something very much important we have to learn because even we getting a lot of support, we getting a lot of, I think, kind of the uh, yeah, uh, support from international organization, great power, but at the end of the day, it's our hand. How we'll go and how we'll take our decision, how we'll go in which direction. So this is something we have learned. And also this is something that I want to share with my audience. Definitely, 
as you mentioned, like we Tibetans also, the current scenario that we face, like how in a way China illegally occupied our territory, we find a lot of similarities between what is happening between Ukraine and Russia right now. So yeah, very interesting also. Mm -hmm. So now let's move on to the sub, to the major theme of our session today, which is the middle way approach. So you've shed some light on it, like what your organization does and the sort of branches that you have. But what exactly is the middle way approach? And are Tibetans in general aware of this policy? And by awareness, I mean like we Tibetans know what the middle way policy is to a certain extent. But what is the nit and gritty of this policy? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a very much important question that we have to understand. Because the before I'm going to answer for that question, I, I want to share something related to that question. Okay. Because in our society, in a particular society in exile, I mean in exile community, there are lots of Tibetan people who don't know what is middle way approach, who don't have exact information, exact kind of awareness of middle way approach. So that's, they always have kind of the misconception and misperception of middle way approach. So that's why I think this is something very much risk that we will face in our future. So that's why what I mean is we have to understand that exact question like that, what is middle way approaches. So now I'm going to give answer for your question. If I give you a simple way, uh, it is kind of the police Police, you know, it's kind of police, or it's kind of the political approach that we have brought to resolve the conflict between China and Tibet, and also that kind of police try to bring kind of solution and kind of the agreement between China and Tibet. So this is kind of the simple explanation, or kind of I think um, primary the definition of the middle way approach. It's a police, right? But if I go to in deeper kind of the explanation or deeper uh, articulation of the middle way approach, then I think we have to touch that particular word like the middle, middle path, middle uh, approach. That means when we are talking about middle path, definitely that has two sides, two paths. If there is no two path, then how we'll have a, that kind of middle path? So that's why we have to understand these three, I think, kind of dimension, these three kind of path, uh, two sides and in the middle way. So middle way like that, uh, what we are seeking and what we are uh, trying to uh, something looking for is the middle path. Mm -hmm. That means we are not looking for these two sides, right? So we have to understand what is these two sides, right? The one side is like the, since China has illegally occupied Tibet in 1959, right? You also know it, right? So from that, from that onwards, there is always conflict between China and Tibet. And also, even China has occupied Tibet in illegal in 1959, but in historical Tibet still is an independent country, is a sovereign nation. So that's we have historical right to see what we were in history. So this is one side. I mean, the we are seeking, we have right to seek full independence. This is one side, right? Yeah. The other side is that uh, we are not happy and we are not satisfied with what China is doing today in inside Tibet. Mm -hmm. I mean, what China has implemented kind of the political structure in Tibet since 1915. And we are not happy and we are not satisfied with these mm -hmm. things. Like, I mean, China has the divided rule that Tibet has, Tibet region has divided into different parts. Even some, it, I mean, some Eastern Tibet parties put under Chinese kind of the province, the Chinese districts. So, so that's why we are not happy with these sort of the political kind of system structures. So, we are not looking for these two sides. That means we are looking for that middle way approach. Then what is that middle way approach? That middle way approach is, is general autonomous, right? General autonomous. And also that kind of general autonomous or that kind of general autonomous status is not something that out of Chinese constitution. It is already exists in Chinese constitution. We are not seeking something new out of Chinese constitution. So that's why middle way approach is something like that. One side, we are not seeking fully independence, even though we have the historical right to seek it. We are not seeking it. We are not talking about history. Is, is history is history. We are looking more in future, future right, future relationship with China. That one side. Other side is we are not happy with what China is doing today inside Tibet. So between these two way, we are seeking middle way, seeking general autonomous status that has already given in Chinese constitution. So that's why this is, a, I think, kind of the middle way approaches. Definitely, you really hit the hammer on it, I should say, on the middle way approach. You really gave out a detailed explanation. What we Tibetans, especially the Central Tibetan Administration, which is representing all us Tibetans in the diasporic community, stands for, you know, with this policy of how this policy is something that is not only within the constitution, but something that we Tibetans and our, in a way, how should I put it, our conquerors, should I say, we can work out. Because at the end of the day, 
this policy very much in some ways like being a pol science student even you are pol yeah, science yeah. students right like we learn about machiavelli the prince you tend to keep the nation first but this is something what i personally feel is this is beyond that is something of a new sort of political theory that we tibetans have brought to the table exactly, and i think yeah. we should work on it don't you think so also? yeah yeah exactly that that's you have hit exactly mm. point that i want to share here so exactly the one is comes to middle way approaches actually it has a lot of the dimension it is a lot of the principle or the perspectives right but i'm try to emphasize here all in three important perspective as you have already hit that point so first per- perspective is is kind of the moral based perspective moral based perspective or is kind of moral based principle and second perspective is the political perspective right and third perspective is a strategical perspective so i used to uh, define middle way approach through basis of these three principle or these three perspectives right so when it comes to the first perspective i mean the moral perspective which says like that uh, when it comes to conflict is not only the conflict uh, political issue political conflicts there are lots of other natural conflicts like i think social conflict and there are many other conflicts so that's why in order to resolve these sort of conflicts we have to find a kind of the moral based kind of the solutions so that moral based solution means is means exactly like the mutual understanding right mm-hmm. mutual acceptance mutual concerning and that means we have to think each side we don't think only ourselves right so this is moral based even i think when it comes to the tibet and china conflicts we tibet and through middle way approach we try to think not only for for us but also for china because we already saying we are not seeking what we were in history that means we think for china right so this is a, the way how to resolve issue through moral perspective so this is first perspective of the moral i think the uh, kind of the middle way approach so that's what that kind of the i think moral perspective is apply in everywhere and in every conflict not only political conflict or not only tibet or china conflict yeah. so this is a kind of the moral perspective right the second perspective is political perspective so when it comes to the political perspective that means we particularly focus on political issue so political issue means that the i think that uh, we have faced lots of i think kind of the uh, the the humanitarian kind of i think the, the disasters in our history i mean then in first world war and second world war how many people has been died how many people has been i think lost their family in the first and second world war these all are because of political issues these all because of the political conflicts but at at end of day in how second world war and how european union has been become such i think kind of i think uh, the perfect union because at at end of day they realize we kind to of find solution by fight by means of war mm. we have to think each other we have to think mutual understand uh, mutual concern so that's why they ignore the ego i mean they in the first how first world war happened because they they are so much ego in the the empire in european union so that's why in at end of the all this european capital they ignore the ego and they try to think each other so that's why they brought such beautiful and such great union so this is political perspective so this kind of i think kind of the i think uh, the solo uh, this kind of the uh, method is able in everywhere so this is the second i think perspective of middle way approaches how we can resolve the political issue by bringing the the kind of middle way approach right the uh, third perspective perspective is the strategical perspective right the strategical perspective means i mean i mean that when it comes to the international kind of the problem and then when it comes to the international conflicts at the at end of days every country looking for their own interest they will not care about others even they i kind of they allies their friend they don't care about they only look their own people's interest their own people's aspiration so that's why at the end of the is 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 all our hand how we can take decision or how we can take kind of the i think uh, how how we will choose our directions so that's why middle way approach is something that we have choose on the basis of aspiration and expectation of different people so that's why this is third i kind of the strategical perspective of the middle way approach even we have lot of the i think uh the international kind of support and we have a lot of great power support but that support we not bring the real kind of i think kind of the i think direction that we went in our future in for long time so that's a we choose middle way approach that will bring something that for uh for different people so that's all definitely one so you really 
elaborate and gave a very elaborate explanation explanation on this middle way approach. But something that uh, is very much evident in our exiled Tibetan community when it comes to the middle way approach is how there is this generational chasm, especially between the younger generation. Uh, I can say that I think I can <coughs> say that the younger generation, most of them, <laughs> maybe if I give it in percentage, maybe 60, 70, more than 70 maybe, like, they tend to favor, not favor middle way and opt for this other path, which is also very prevalent, the yeah, rather yeah, yeah. complete independence. And the older generation, we see how they are more or less go along with the middle way. So, why do you think there is such varied opinion among our very own Tibetan diaspora community on this policy when it comes to resolving the Tibet-China conflict? Yeah, I think this is a also a very important question and this is something that we are concerning that the why we our organization is creating and uh, forming is also for these kind of the problems because there is a huge gap between the new generation, older generation for I think for understanding of the middle way approaches. So that's why I think this gap is because of I think kind of the uh, the kind of atmosphere, kind of society where how we can the uh, how we can educate these young generation about middle way approaches. I, I, uh, from basis of my own experience, right, when I was in TCV Suja, I, I, I haven't, I think, hear the mid, uh, about middle way approach, right? And also, there is not that much more discussion about middle way approaches. So this is some society where we grew up and our young generation grew up. So that's why this sort of the gap is occur in our society. For it, it, when it's, uh, I think, in terms of the Rangzen or in terms of the independence. That sort of the, I think, kind of the mindset is already exists in our mind. When we are small, said our grandfather, our, our, our forward, always talk about it. We lost our independence under China, and China is our enemy. We have already that sort of the kind of I think thinking in our mind. But middle way approach is something is come, I think, later, right? Is something is new concept and something new policies. So that's why I think problem is that the uh, if I say directly. Uh, our CDA is also, uh, I think, kind of the should more focus on that particular, I think, uh, police to, I think, share and uh, to educate people what is middle way, uh, what is middle way, but despite they believing or not, mm -hmm. it's their choice. At the end of the day, it's their choice whether they believing or not, but they should educate it. Once they educated about the middle way approach, then they can realize, they can, they can decide it, whether it is right or wrong. Otherwise, today in our society, many people blaming and many people criticize middle way approach. It's something like something like that, but they don't have any knowledge. So that's why, my I think, uh, the my take on that the why there is huge gap between the older generation, new generations, only because of society and atmosphere where they didn't get kind of access to learn about it. So we have to bring more access, bring more platform to. Uh, discuss about middle way approach. Even our organization, main objectives like this. Yeah, definitely, and your organization, as you say, very much fills this very vacuum that is present in our community. And I think, I think we should make this clear now, because I think middle way approach, in the sense in Tibetan, it's called Umelam. So yes. They don't say that Tibet is part of China in their own records. It's like Tibet was historically independent. That's what middle way approaches also believe. I think you should set the record straight on that, right, Monsula? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think your questions like that in in our community, in our society, mm -hmm. some people thought like I uh, think like that. If we are seeking middle way approach, that means we are accepting what China has the, I think kind of the giving some interaction, kind of the I think kind of, uh, definition of historical relationship between China or Tibet. China used to say like the Tibet was part of China, but when we are seeking middle way approach, that doesn't mean that we are accepting what 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 we were in history. And history, history is history. No one will change history. No one will, I think, kind of the uh, change the course of histories. Histories always exist as history. So that's why even we are seeking middle way approaches. But history is always history. That means Tibet was never being part of China. Tibet was historical. It's an independent country. It's a sovereign nation. We have all kind of, I think, kind of the uh, proofs that can approve that Tibet was never being part of China. So this is uh, uh, something uh, very clear that the uh, those who are seeking middle way approach, those, those who are following middle way approach, that doesn't mean they are accepting what China is. If we are accepting what China went, then why China not accepting middle way approach? Because China used to reject middle way approach. That means we are not accepting what China thought the thing like. Definitely, Wang Chula. And on top of this, like in much earlier instances, you mentioned how middle way is like the middle of the spectrum. So. Recently, in one of our FNVS program, one of our speakers, you know, 
he very much pointed out how in the Tibetan community there is this binary between some go for Ramzan and the other goes for Umilam or Middle Way. And he sort of narrated how there is a possibility or the need of a third alternative. So what is your thought on that? Yeah, I think uh, this is something uh, kind of opinion that has arisen from our society that uh, somebody is saying like that, no, we, we can't more rely on middle way approach that because we can't get any solution any, any outcome from middle way approach. that means they're looking for another alternative uh, kind of the path mm -hmm. but it yet to come right yeah. it's still not in our society so that's why i think it at end of day it depends on people's hands people's choice if majority people want to change that kind of policy and if majority people want to have kind of alternative policy definitely if they'll depends on people's if no one will dictate and no one will i think forcefully people to take any kind of the other uh, kind of, I think, path. It depends on people's choice. So I think uh, at the end of the day, it's people's choice. Definitely. Whatever policies that the city or, uh -huh. or the Tibetans take forward, at the end of the day, it's the will of the Tibetans. Yeah, will of, yeah, yeah. It is the consensus. Unless and until that is achieved, I think you won't move ahead. Yeah. Even I think when it comes to the middle way approach, mm -hmm. so it's also people's view, people's choice. Because middle way approach has been democratically elected in our parliament. For not only one time, only I think almost three, several times, it has been elected based on people's choice. If people don't like this sort of policy, if people don't, I think, satisfy with this policy, then it will change. But on the basis of three referendum, it has always got a majority support. So that's why this is people's choice, middle way approaches. Definitely, Wangshu. So one thing that you mentioned, like how you came from Tibet and being a Tibetan, you know, what is your view on the current predicament? Like we are moving away from the middle way, so yeah. like we are going on to nit and gritty uh, and what's happening to our Tibetan brothers and sisters inside Tibet. So what sort of predicament do you think our brothers and sisters and even us in exile we yeah, face yeah. when it comes to the current, you know, PRC yeah, juggernaut that yeah, seems yeah. to be everywhere, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jinping visited yeah, to, to, yeah. So a lot of things are happening, but what is really happening to our sisters? And brothers inside Tibet. Yeah, I think as uh, we Tibetan who live in here exile and we are doing something for those who live inside and are Chinese aggression, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the one of most important thing that we need to know about inside Tibet is that first we first we have to understand what re, what realistic things going inside Tibet, right? What what China is doing something inside Tibet? Or I think on that kind of the kind of the issue we can't be I think an exaggeration, right? We we should be very realistic. What China is doing? I mean, economically, politically, and social. What China is doing? How China is, I think, kind of destroying our culture and our, our identity and our kind of the our language. So these are very kind of the issue that we have to understand. For example, I I give you one example, right? Uh, you know TikTok, right? Yep. TikTok is very much popular in the in in everywhere, right? Inside in China, inside in China, or is in Tibet, right? TikTok version is total difference. Oh. It's Chinese version, right? Mm -hmm. So I used to watch sometimes of the Chinese version of TikTok, right? In which anybody try to speak in Tibetan language, they will ban it. Oh. They are not allowed to speak, right? They should speak in Tibetan Chinese language. Even they, a lot of Tibetan, I think TikTok bubblers, right? They used to going live and they going, I think, have a so, sort of thing debate in TikTok, right? They try to speak in Tibetan, they will ban. So that that how Ch China is doing inside Tibet. These are major concerns that we have to understand, right? So the, my uh, I, my final take on is that we have to understand what realistic things going on there. That's very much important. Definitely, yeah. and TikTok <coughs> currently, if I'm not wrong, is currently under the hammer, should I say, when it comes to USA. <laughs> going to the Senate testimonies and you rightly pointed out, even for me, this is the first time hearing it, you know how I knew that there were different versions of TikTok, but I didn't know what was happening to the Tibetans inside Occupied Tibet, how, you know, they were not allowed to speak in Tibetan once they do, you rightly said so, they were being banned, pushed away from this platform, so this shows how Tibetans inside Tibet are not treated as human beings at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need to make it something, uh, I think, clear that I, I uh, use one word wrong. It's not like ban. Okay. If I say ban is something exactly different word, I mean that is they stopped, they can't go live. Okay. 
they, they, they give some signal. If you speak Tibet and you will not allow to go live. So then your live stream is stopped? Oh, stopped. They, right. they should speak in Tib the Chinese. So this is how uh, the China is censoring in the social media, right? So we've run short on time, unfortunately, okay. Monsula. So finally, I would like to ask you whether you have any messages to our Tibetans, brother and sisters worldwide, and also the plethora of Tibetan supporters who continue to stand by us. So, I, I, I think, actually I don't have any special things to share with all this Tibetan community, even I'm not in that position to give kind of the message, right? But as a Tibetan citizen, as a Tibetan a refuge will stay here in the exile, right? So what I want to say here is that we have to study about politics, right? We have to study about international politics. This is very much important. Even today we are facing a lot of problem in a community, in small community, I mean the regionalism kind of like this and we have uh, our, even if I say it, uh, true and something directly we, we we are not necessarily hide what things happen in our society we are totally divided our society is so much polarized right so all these things happen not because of the cause of regionalism it's because of we are uneducated right all course like this if we are educated about politics then we will realize that with which direction we are going and which kind of the kind of the part that we are choosing today it's very much dangerous, it's very much risk. If, if we're doing these kind of things, again, I can definitely, there's some who are funding these sort of things, activity, right? So that's what my point is, we have to be educated about the politics. Because we stay here, exiled almost, I think, 60 years. years. We have uh, all this, I think, kind of the material and kind of opportunity to study whatever things happen around, not around in the world. It's not like those who are in, inside Tibet. So we have to be like what we are today here. Otherwise, we will, I think killed by ourselves, not by Chinese. If we do this kind of thing, again, again. So this is my final kind of the suggestion, not advice, because I'm not that <laughs> position. Okay, thank you. Indeed, Bonsula. So very beautifully shared, you know, like uh, a concern as a t fellow Tibetan, you know, you really pointed out it. And I hope our audience would take notice and heed on his words. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude our session. But before wrapping things up, I would like to Read an excerpt from the late Tupin Sambe's book, which I just finished reading. Okay. It's the book title is Falling Through the Roof. So one passage from this book. It's very interesting, Monsula. I believe every beginning begins with hope. Every end ends in a prayer. So on that note, Monsula, thank you for coming to our session here, taking time from your busy schedule and even your you know YouTube schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, Monsula. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank. And also, uh, finally, I also I like to say thanks for your organization and your uh, invitation. We are very happy to speak on your program, and we will uh, look for more interaction. Us, okay? Thank you. Thank you. For more updates and videos by FNBA, click on the link and please subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching.